Okay, so my name is uh, Michael. I'm a recent graduate at the University of Copenhagen as a master in computer science. And in relation to my master thesis, I've uh, conducted some research together with my two supervisors named Shan Su and Kichi Li, which I will be presenting here. Yes, so I assume everyone is familiar with information retrieval in general. So I will not discuss much about that. Instead, I will simply go towards the advantages and disadvantages of especially sparse IR. So for sparse IR, we know that due to the, the, the way we transform the text, uh, the way we do text representation in general, we transform from text to sparse encoded vectors. That sparse IR in general comes with a low computational cost. It's very time efficient. And it's also an easy to interpret method to use. But some of the limitations with sparse IR in general is that they often lack semantic understanding and also fail to have a bigger contextual understanding of terms and queries and documents, like the relation between the terms. This is an inherent problem in general for sparse IR, such that if the query is very short and the document in general is very long, and if there exists a vocabulary mismatch, it will be difficult to conduct uh, effective sparse retrieval. We know that dense information retrieval has tried to solve this issue by transforming the text from text to dense vector representations, uh, measuring up, uh, you say, having these continuous uh, uh, vector representations. This allows for better semantic and contextual understanding, but it also has the limitation that we have to conduct a, a lengthy and computational costly uh, supervised phase, which can be a limitation when applied in the real world setting. So yeah, dense IR is very time efficient, comes with high computational costs, and it also has, to some extent, a poor uh, degree of uh, interoperability. Therefore, our research is targeted towards sparse IR and how we can make sparse IR more effective. Uh, many studies have been targeted towards how we can improve sparse IR in general. Stuff like uh, pseudo relevance feedback is a classical query expansion method, which aims to try and minimize the query document mismatch by uh, applying yeah, different pseudo methods. Uh, it has proven for, to, uh, there's a huge dependency in general uh, when you apply pseudo relevance feedback that the initial ranking that is often obtained using sparse methods, that if the initial ranking is inaccurate, it will be difficult to obtain relevant terms from the initial ranking. So if the initial ranking is inaccurate, the retrieval results will often also end up being weak. If the initial ranking is very accurate, you might be able to slightly improve the recall results. Uh, but studies have shown that classical queue expansions might not be so capable in improving top-heavy ranking metrics. Recently, large language models has shown promising results and have excelled at text understanding, text generation, and memorization, which makes it a suitable candidate for a new way of applying queue uh, expansion. Our idea is to leverage LLM as a black box model where you want to use the LLM as a, yeah, you can give it an input query queue and then provide it with some kind of instru in instruction that I will show in the next slide, uh, where we can like skip this phase that we saw in the classical queue expansion method, where we have to obtain an initial ranking. So with the LLM approach, we don't have this dependency of the initial ranking but instead we can simply generate an output based on the query itself and not on some, some ranking. Uh, there's of course some limitations with large language models. It has shown that the data LLMs in general have been trained on comes with a, it has an inherent bias in the data set which might limit the, the effort or the, the effectiveness of the LLMs when applied. And yeah, there's also other limitations, but I will skip them for now. So our motivation for the study is that how can LLMs be leveraged uh, for query expansion to improve the effectiveness of sparse iron? 
and also how does uh, LLMs in general match up versus classical query expansion methods. Our methods uh, for sparse IR uh, is these two proposed here. The quality is super bad, I apologize for that. But our approach is that we want to, uh, on the left side, what is known as generative query expansion. We want to try to paraphrase the query such that uh, yeah, you have a query which is tried to show here and you have an output which tries to paraphrase the query. Uh, you can see, or slightly see, that uh, the structure of the query ends up being very similar to the original query. There's not a lot of new terms added, or at least not uh, if you compare to our approach, not uh, the amount of text is very different. Uh, but the idea is that this rephrasing strategy will help generate new, unique keywords that might be beneficial for a sparse IR method like BM25, which can help maybe generate some new, unique keywords that can overlap between query and document. Our second approach is generative query expansion, where instead of paraphrasing, we want the uh, LLM to answer the query that we have asked. Have. So that's the output we see on the bottom right. That's the an answer to the query. And you can see the answer is very lengthy, means there's a higher chance that new unique keywords will be generated, but there's also the inherent risk that the new generated keywords are noise, like it helps prom it helps to generate or uh, promote unknown or uh, unwanted uh, documents that would not necessarily be recommended highly. But I have a graph showing that later. Uh, how can we use these outputs and combine it with our original queries? You can try to do different string concatenation strategies. Uh, so that is what I have tried to show here. We have tried multiple approaches where we combined an original query, for example, with one refresh query, and just string them together and try and use that as our new query for retrieval. Overall, I will not go through all of these approaches, but overall, for the GQR approach, the results showed that combining free queries and free free race queries gave the best results for us. And for the GQE approach, it was the GQE Q5 approach with five original queries and one solo document. But be aware, this is kind of a hyperparameter. It's not always this, the case that this is the correct answers. It's highly dependable on the data set, data set you're using and stuff like that. Uh, if we briefly go through the experiments and the implementation setup, so I have used the GPT Turbo 3.5 from OpenAI, uh, and for the retrieval process, I've used Pyteria with stop word removal, uh, English tokenizer, and uh, portal stemming. But the reason why I've used uh, yeah, applied all these methods. Uh, stop word removal, tokenizing, and portal stemming is to make the BN25 approach as efficient as possible, time efficient. Uh, the baselines I compare our methods with is uh, the classical approach RM3, which is a pseudo relevance feedback approach, and then two other well known uh, generative query expansion methods, Query to Duck, uh, conducted by Wang in 2023, and then uh, uh, extra study into the the approach conducted by Jägerman called QTD, where he applies what is known as chain of thought problem. Briefly, if we discuss what is the difference between my approaches and their two approaches. So my approach uses what is known as zero-shot setting a prompting technique. So in the zero-shot prompting technique, the idea is that we simply go in and ask the LLM to produce an answer for the query without providing any information prior. So if you look at the fuchsia prompting, which is the uh, weighing approach, he uh, gives like examples of what the uh, what a query might look like and what the passage might look like. It's not always you have like examples like this that can be used. So that is why I use the zero shot prompting technique. For the chain of thought prompting uh, technique, the idea is that you want to provide a rational before you answer. I'll instruct the LLM to provide a rational before it answers the query. And the, re uh, the reason for the uh, chain of thought prompting technique is that the rational can help generate new, unique keywords that again can help 
minimize the lexical gap between query and document and be extra beneficial for sparse AI with its like PM25. Uh, our results shown here, I hope you can see them. Overall, uh, we have seen, or we have observed that our GQE Q5 approach is using uh, significance testing, uh, T significance testing, we have shown that uh, the GQE Q5 approach is uh, statistically significantly better than uh, the BM25 for these three uh, benchmark data sets the MS Marco dataset, the natural questions dataset, and the track datasets uh, for these evaluation metrics. Uh, yeah, so we have observed that the GQE Q5 approach is better than just uh, no query expansion at all. Uh, but also comparing uh, student documents like the GQE QE5 approach with the GQR approach, we have seen that uh, generating student documents is significantly better than doing rephrasing. So yeah, our second approach was significantly better than the rephrasing approach. Finally, we have also seen there's a huge importance of maintaining the original query. Uh, when you do these types of query expansion, you don't want to just disregard the original query because it holds uh, great importance uh, in the expanded version, which is observed in the two bottom lines where there's it's a statistically significant difference between Q5 and Q0. Uh, yeah. Finally, if we compare zero relevance feedback with uh, GQ5, uh, Q5, I mean, so ARM3 with Q5, there's again observed a statistically significant difference when using generative queue expansion compared to uh, a classical queue expansion. Finally, if we compare my results with uh, well established uh, uh, other documented results for generative query expansion from Wang and Jägerman, uh, my results compared to Wang's were kind of similar. In theory, his approach should be superior to mine. Uh, the future uh, prompting technique should, in theory, help provide more relevant terms that can be used for sparse retrieval because it has seen examples of how uh, a, a query and a, a passage might look like. The same should be the case for the chain of thought prompting approach, should help uh, yeah, generate new unique relevant terms, but there's also the, the risk of using a weak LLM, so that is actually the case that is showed here. Uh, Jägerman used a very, uh, not a, a powerful LLM compared to the GPT-5, with a uh, fewer numbers of hyperparameters, which is also why the results are slightly worse for him here. But in general, chain of thought prompting is superior to zero shot prompting. Uh, I think this slide will probably be tough for you to see. But what I have tried to show here is that if you have a query which is shown at the top, and we try to apply different uh, query expansion methods, so at the top we see I'm free, generates these 10 terms when applying queue expansion. Uh, the term report, for example, is marked red, means the, the word is a new word, new unique keyword, but it's not represented in the ground truth document, which is the relevant document marked in the blue. So because the term is red, that means that other documents that might contain the, the word report will be would, yeah, would, would be ranked higher in the retrieval process, uh, but it's not a relevant document, so it's actually a noisy word that is added here. Compared to the green words, or the, t yeah, the green words, they actually are represented in the crowd truth document. Because they're represented in the crowd truth document, you can say that's a new, unique keyword that has been added. So if you add interest, or not interest, but for example, minority to the original query, that will be a, a new unique key, keyword that overlaps with the ground truth document. And the idea is that if we compare pseudo documents with rephrasing here, we see that uh, there's a substantially greater amount of green words compared to red words for pseudo documents, which also means that the final rank, if you look at the bottom, we see that when we apply GQE, the rank goes from being 101 in the standard uh, BM25 rank on the left 
to now being ranked uh, yeah, three when applying pseudo uh, cure expense. If we compare with refacing for this example, we see that uh, refacing does not have the same effect, meaning the new uh, generated keywords uh, is not not unique enough or not does not uh, overlap as as uh, significantly as the pseudo document approach. But in some cases, pseudo documents is not suitable for cure expansion. So I've tried to show here an example of some situation where it might fail to apply pseudo-document uh, expansion. In this case, we have a query saying how many episodes are in Chicago Fire Season 4, and the generated pseudo-document actually ends up uh, producing uh, an output that uh, tries to explain the theme of the show, whereas the ground truth document explains like the setting of the show. So the ground truth document describes like who's the producer of the show, who has been like participating in the show, whereas the pseudo document is like, yeah, what can you say? Like, what is the story in the show, right? Because the difference in, what can you say, the setting or like the, the narrative of the documents is so vastly different, it also ends up generating so many noisy terms. And when you then apply these noisy terms to the original query in the query expansion, it ends up, in this case, worsening the ranking by five positions compared to, for example, re rephrasing, it's only one position. So in some cases, GQE is not always suitable. Uh, yes. Uh, that's the overall uh, observations we have made. So I don't, uh, how much time do I have left? Just go ahead. Okay, so couple of minutes. Uh, the take home message from our studies would be that overall we have seen that generative Q expansion is especially effective for sparse IR compared to, for example, classical Q expansion. We observed that uh, pseudo, document, uh, pseudo documents in general provide much more uh, relevant information compared to rephrasing helps minimize the lexical gap between query and document in a better way compared to rephrasing because of the extent of yeah, positive terms added to to the query. Of course, there are some concerns. There will always be concerns with new, new ideas. Uh, for example, there's the, uh, the issue that the, the answer might be false. If, in terms of this situation, like we saw just before, the answer was not false, but it was slightly oriented in the different direction, which meant that the generated terms ended up being, yeah, uh, negative or, or noisy, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, Is it uh, applicable in a realistic real-world setting? Should Google just go out and try to implement this in their search engines? I mean, there's always, for example, I use OpenAI GPT 3.5. It comes with a huge latency if you want to apply the LLM. So you have to make the decision yourself. Do you want to slow down the, the web search for the users? It might annoy the users to wait uh, for the web search engine to first rephrase the query, then expand the query, and then extract uh, a relevant document. Is it better to simply just maintain the original uh, search engine without the query expansion? That's a, yeah, that's a thing you have to discuss. Uh, that's all.